and tell me when you see the live up there. We yeah, got I see it. live. Got it. Okay. See both record it. and live. Mm -hmm. So where did it go? So what's going on? It that okay, might be Baron, us. You're on. I think we're on the air. Yep, we're on the air. My goodness. This, uh, this M51B picture that you put in your uh, attachment to the email, was that Hubble or is that from here on Earth? So say that again. <laughs> the uh, picture the, of the nebula, M51. Oh, yeah, that's a Hubble picture I got off the Internet. I did not take okay. that. Okay. We may be joining the program in progress. Mr. Tom Totten, former president, webmaster, where do we stand here? We're, we're on. We're, we're hey. live. We're going. Well, then, welcome aboard. Uh, you just caught us talking because that's what we do a lot. Welcome to episode 16, ladies and gentlemen. Series one for Monday, June 14th, the big weekly podcast, Monday mornings at 11, of your Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit. Call it the SBAU Astro Hour. I'm Baron Ron Heron. Proud to have you guys on board. I want to say right now, we take on some pretty heavy science subjects during this program, but our brain trust on board, all six of us, well, the other four or five, will do our best to make it understandable. Now, if you get lost in any of the topics we're going to kick around this hour uh, that you're watching on YouTube, by guy, log into your question below in the comments section or send an email to our webmaster who's back in Detroit, but I assume getting his messages there, south of Detroit, Michigan. We did hear from a Karen about last week's uh, interesting question submitted by Mr. President, I'll introduce you to here in a minute, about mirrors and reflections, something I had never thought of. This hour, we're going to answer it. I'm not sure why we didn't get to it last hour. We will have our distinguished press, Jerry, uh, answer, Jerry Wilson, uh, the puzzle later in the hour. And welcome aboard. We're going to talk space stuff. Let's introduce you to everybody. Jerry Wilson, Mr. President, for three sessions. There he is. Good morning. And his wife, Pat Forgey, in the background. Tom Totten, as I said, is out of town and back in the Midwest. There is our webmaster. And we have uh, Chuck McPartland, our incredible outreach coordinator, somehow doing some outreach these days, most of it online, if you have anything. Uh, I guess you had to cancel that second uh, slideshow up at the lake. Yeah, Kachuma, it turns out, didn't have enough employees to uh, do both daytime and evening activities that day, so they had to cancel. Oh, okay. Well, I thought maybe we just didn't have enough people show up, but it's campers that get that program, isn't it? Right. And, and normally, if we don't have pandemics, it's us going up there, either for a big meal and a show or set our telescopes up or what have you. Well, normally those would be a slideshow and then telescopes out on Dakota Plains for the campers. Yeah. All right. Let's introduce you to the rest of them at the bottom of the screen on the right. Tom Whittemore, my wife, Maureen, in the background. He is a former Westmont College science instructor, editor of our incredible newsletter. If you don't get it, by God, call us, let us know, and we'll let you get it. And there is Bruce Murdoch with a new microphone. How are you, Bruce? <laughs> incredible, as usual. How's your incredible theater organ society you're president of? Is it functioning for the pandemic? Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, they're doing a, a virtual solstice parade on whatever it is, I think the 23rd. Uh, yeah. And it will be videoed, and then they'll play the videos back at the Arlington for people to see. And hopefully we'll have a theater pipe organ concert to go along with that. So this will be past solstice parades that were videoed and they're going to. No, the, the current, the one that's happening, it, you know, it, it will be videoed and then the video will be played in the Arlington Theater, which can now be uh, up to 50 percent occupancy because we're in the yellow, yellow zone. But I don't think and we're going to have a live parade out in the street. It's at State Street, not in no, I, June. Ron, they're, they're doing a virtual solstice parade. So they're they're. <laughs> videoing various groups that would normally be marching in the parade offline oh, you know, okay. in other locations, and then they're going to join those together. Oh, see. okay, that makes sense. Well, just between you and me and the wall, past parades are just as crazy, and nobody would probably know the difference, but nevertheless, <laughs> these are the headlines we're going to talk about this hour. Uh, we got um, something about motion data coming in on so-called S-stars at the center of our incredible Milky Way galaxy. Mr. President and Mr. Outreach Coordinator and others will talk about three missions to Venus by the end of the decades and the most 
rich man on the planet, the richest guy, Mr. Bezos of uh, Amazon is going into space in a little more than a month. And uh, what's called his, what is it? The new origins rocket ship on the new Shepard capsule with his brother who's going along for free and a guy that just paid $28 million for a seat. And that's an 11 minute flight. And it only goes up what 60 miles, kind of like the old Mercury program and you're waitlist for three minutes and it comes back. Anybody want to come in on that story before we get I to wonder the what story? the meal service is on that flight. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I guess yeah. it's, it's shaped like an airplane, doesn't it? it it's got rocket oh. in the middle. No, okay. that's the Virgin Atlantic one. The, the Bezos yeah. capsule is a, is a capsule with a bunch of windows. Oh, oh, you're absolutely right. And his his whole thing is called uh, New Horizon or New uh, Blue Horizon. Blue Origin. Oh, Blue Origin. Blue, yeah. Jeez, I'll get it right. Well, <laughs> shall we uh, keep everybody hooked, Mr. President, about the mirror thing? Shall we pose it now and then answer it later? You want to go into details on what you came up with last week that stumped many okay. of us. I can explain it. Um, it's a trick, you mean it's a the cartoon question. with the two two telescopes? No, 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 no. This this is the mirror re no. reflection. Oh, that's thing. a yeah. That's a has mirror in the title. True. Right. The, um, the what the question that I posed last time was: When you look in a mirror, uh, why does the mirror reverse right for left but not top for bottom? And of course, it's a trick question. Uh, depending on the semantics, um, if you stand, for example, facing north, and you have a mirror in front of you, and you look at your own reflection in the mirror, then you stick your right arm out, then the, um, that's, Left the east, arm on this. that's the east arm. And yeah, appears to get it. Do you have out, a question, right? Chuck, or do you want? No, I'm just hold, <laughs> holding it. Okay. So <laughs> you stick your right arm out, that's the, um, that's east. So that's your east arm, and your left arm is the west arm. <laughs> Now, if you look in the mirror and you see your reflection, it's also holding out the east arm because it, it doesn't translate right for left. It keeps things straight. But we define right for left with respect to the person. So if the mirror were gone and you were standing there looking at another person and you held out your right arm and they mimicked the mirror, they would hold out their left arm. But in order to have an east arm because they're facing 180 degrees different than you. So you assume the mirror is actually like another person. And when you hold out your right arm, your reflection holds out its left arm. Yeah. But it's not, it's holding out your right arm. If you look real close, you hold out the arm, for example, that has a watch on it. You'll see the mirror also holds out the arm that has a watch on it. It's not flipping right or left. It's an assumption we make about what we're looking at. But what it's is reverse? What we, is we reverse of, what, what, What's that? What about north and south vertically? What's reversed? Nothing. There's nothing reversed in a mirror. Oh, there isn't anything even in regular. No, you 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 to suppose your mind what it would look like if you walked around where the mirror was and looked at yourself. Right. That's what you see in the mirror. Yeah. Okay. Well, assuming it's like a real person. But so Ron, Ron, yes. the whole technically is upside down according to your eye we our brain just basically <laughs> re reorients it that's true i've heard that yeah you're right well, everything's true. upside down in your eye so mm -hmm. no but the, <laughs> okay, uh, so the, the the dial mirrors that are telescopes they um, they do flip the image in fact because i bump in this i have a prism in mine and people look at my telescope and they say your your image is backwards and i said no my image is not backwards your image is backwards because yeah. they have just a mirror rather than a, a roof prism. So it's the same process that happens to your reflectors. Okay. So anyway, Karen, if you're listening, um, if that doesn't satisfy you or you need more explanation, I can write out something in detail for you. Please, please let us know. Um, these are subtle, subtle uh, meaning things. There's conflicts. I used to tutor a lot when I was a graduate student. And one of the things I noticed other majors, English majors and pre-meds would complain that physics was so difficult. And one of the reasons that I found out that it looks that way is because in, like any discipline, they, they need words to describe everything. And they take words out of common usage, colloquial words, but they give them an entirely different and precise meaning. 
And if you're sitting in class trying to figure things out and you, you're relying on colloquial meanings of words and, and you haven't learned the physics meaning of it, you can get mighty confused. So uh, um, anyway, <coughs> on to the next thing. So just uh, to let you know well, that Feynman. There, there's, yeah, yeah Fein, Feynman has a great explanation on YouTube talking about mirrors that it's worth uh, listening to. So if you get a chance, okay. see, see that on YouTube. Well, we've got a lot of topics here today. <laughs> In some fun houses and science museums, I believe they have uh, mirrors that are involved, two mirrors. One's a reflection of the mirror and it shows you as you actually are. Yeah. Uh, you, you put out your right arm here, but and it shows your right and arm. Right arm other. on your image goes out the other <laughs> way. Yeah, it, it's more like uh, an obedient friend. Now, if you take two mirrors at 90 degrees and put them in front of you, so you get double reflection, then when you stick out your right arm, the reflection will stick out its right arm. Well, now, I won't invert that. Okay. In times, in times Aaron, what, past, past, the periscope on a submarine had two mirrors, one at the bottom and one at the top, which would have given you an exact look, wouldn't it? No, um, that was, but, but the purpose was to change the direction you're looking so you didn't have to stick your head up above the water. <laughs> oh, I understand, I understand I that, but it wasn't one mirror, it was two. No, it was two mirrors. We're looking around corners. And of course, nowadays it's all video. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, so we got that done for Karen. Let's find out if she's a member and you want to join sbau.org or call the webmaster or whatever. What do you want to talk about first, Mr. President? There's a bunch of stuff going on uh, later Let's on. Let's talk Venus. about the asteroid occultations. Oh, okay. Are you doing oh, that down again? to bottom? Yeah. Yeah. Chuck, Chuck you're, the, you're the one that does the occultations. You want to explain to the folks what that is, what you're doing? Well, this, this to start. occultations, asteroid occultations are where an asteroid passes between us and a distant star, you know, since they're closer to us, and they cause the star to wink out for a few seconds. And if enough people collect data on it, the video, for example, of the star winking out with accurate timing and GPS information, then you can actually plot the, uh, uh, the star. Now, this is, this is the example of an asteroid just recently it's a double asteroid, Patroclus and Menetius. It's a Trojan, a Jupiter Trojan asteroid. And uh, there's a Lucy mission that's going to go out and visit it. So we're trying to collect data on it. And so here you can see where people are distributed across the US uh, attempting to catch these shadow paths. And the, the upper path is Patroclus, which is the larger of the pair. They're two almost the same size asteroids that orbit a common center of mass, very close to each other. And then the bottom shadow line is Menetius. The green is the center line and the blue is the expected extent of the shadow. So the shadow is the same size as the asteroid on the surface of the earth because the stars are so far away, essentially the, the light rays are parallel coming from them. And so you position telescopes along the projected path, which has errors in it because, you know, talking very fine milli arc second measurements here. And so you try to spread out to make sure you catch the shadow. And as you can see, um, People were pretty well distributed, and we got hits on, on both uh, components of this binary asteroid. And um, if you go to the, go to the next uh, photo, that actually shows the profiles of the asteroids. They're pretty much, uh, you know, oblate spheroids. And uh, Patroclus there got pretty well measured. My track is the green one near the top of the top asteroid, number eight there. And uh, then down below is Menetius, which only got hit by a few people. It, it was a little bit south of the center line. They both were, but most people were distributed north of the center line for that one. So a bunch of people missed it, but, but we still got pretty good um, profiles on those asteroids. And so that refines the orbit, of course, because now you have a much more precise position for the asteroid. And so future occultation events will, will, be, uh, will get more data on them. And there was another one uh, that uh, uh, Tom doesn't have the uh, tracks on. The tracks on, but let me let me. Is it okay if I share this one, Tom? Yes. Okay. Let's see here. Oh, you've got share the, uh, screen. Layout. Okay. This is this is a cool one. This one went up on National Donut Day, <laughs> and of course, the path initially looked like there was a hole in the asteroid. Um, but it was offset from the center. And uh, the guy who, who got this data actually said it probably looks more like a croissant. So 
<laughs> it's kind of if it's a single body it kind of looks like a space paramecium here or it could be a double body you can see that nice uh circular part near the bottom that could be it could be a double body with a very close orbit and we looked at him with one in front of the other and so it just he, he got a a little blip there when when uh when it went off of one and before it got uh, occulted by the other so you can find okay. out all kinds of interesting things uh about about these asteroids and get more precise measurements than even, than even Hubble can get uh, just by going out and, and having precise GPS and timing on these things. What was the magnitude of the stars involved in these and also what's a typical time that it's, it's occulted? The, uh, the Patroclus and Menetius star was something like magnitude 13. Uh, and the, um, but it was a fairly long um, occultation potential time of like four and a half seconds. Uh, this one here on 6519PL, um, I'm not seeing what the magnitude of the star was, but it was probably 11 or 12 in that neighborhood. Mm. So, you know, of course, the chance of occulting a dim star is much more than the chance of occulting a bright star because there are a lot more mm -hmm. stars out there that appear dimmer, you know, in the sky because they're farther away. Um, and the, the bigger your aperture of your telescope, of course, the dimmer stars you can, you can do these occultations on. I just have a, a five inch scope, so it's fairly small, but I have a, uh, an integrating camera, which lets me collect up to 8.5 second exposures. So you lose precision on the timing, which is what you really want to go to the dimmer ones. So, um, but, but of course, brighter ones are a lot rarer. So it's kind of a trade off there. What time of the night are you out there doing this, Chuck? That one was at about three in the morning. Patrick Lewis and Manishas. There's one tonight, really tomorrow morning at, at midnight plus 30, you know, at, at 30 minutes into the day. But with the winds we're having, I don't know if I'll observe that. At, on any night, are there many that you can choose from or is it a rare? Did you have two there or three and that's... Uh, Occasionally you'll get two or three a night, but that's rarer. Um, you get about, you know, for me, it's between 10 and 30 a month. Um, and they're usually spread out. Although sometimes you'll get, you know, all of them in, in two weeks. It's just, yeah. it's random. Well, what we're doing, what we're talking about here is what I'm going to call a stellar eclipse. Meaning yeah. there's, there's no way you could see that asteroid, but it's got to be pretty good size, I would imagine. Could you see it? when it's in its normal way away from the star, but getting sunlight off of it, can you zero in? Sometimes, and if the Sometimes. asteroid's big enough, if the asteroid's big enough, you can, but usually the asteroids are so dim, you don't see them at all. If the, other, ge if the other gentleman in the club with telescopes wanted to pursue that as a hobby like you're doing, what would they have to do? Is it just a matter of setting it up and doing it, or do you have to go through training and get special attachments? What does it no, take? There's not really a whole lot of training, but you, you have to have um, the capability to record video. They used to just do it on camcorders. Um, and the ability, what they used to just do it actually with people looking through a, 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 an eyepiece with a WWV with shortwave radio playing in the background as announcing the time. And then they would say, wink out, came back. <laughs> and then that's how people would get the timing. But then it progressed to uh, camcorders uh, with the same thing, people recording, and then uh, VCRs with, uh, with what are called video time inserters, which I have, which actually put the time onto the video. So you don't have to account for people's reaction time. You okay. still have to account for the reaction time of your system, like if there's delays in your camera and delays in your recording. Uh, and... So what I have is a video capture device to suck the video into my laptop onto the disc. And best is a solid state disc because then you don't have latency time on your disc. And, um, and then a video time inserter that, that uh, is also a GPS device. So you do a minute of GPS of your location and then you switch to just straight video for the occultation that has time in the, in the corner, the GPS time. And then you do another minute of GPS at the end and you average all your GPS locations because it dithers around as the satellites come and go. Hmm. Well, for the benefit of any viewers that don't know this much, I think I know those Trojan asteroids you're talking about are in the orbit of Jupiter, which means they're farther out. They're probably even yeah. twice as far as the regular asteroid belt yeah, just between about. Mars and Jupiter. 
Are there two of those two Trojans, one in front of Jupiter and one behind? Yes. Or? The Greeks and the Trojans. Are they, do they number about the same number that are in the asteroid belt? No, there's fewer. There's fewer of them. Yeah. But, and are these the size of series? Are there any small planets? What are they? What are they called? These are these well, are all different sizes. They're not as big as you know Ceres and Pallas and Juno and those, but, I but gotcha. they're decent size. I mean, I think this Patroclus is uh, seventy-four kilometers, something like that. Well, if you go back to the uh, map that you had with the path of the satellite, I believe you said the blue lines were the edges of the shadow of the satellite, which is yes. the, I mean of the of the uh, whatever asteroid right. the size of so the asteroid, you can see yeah. how big it is i mean the one up at uh, top is half uh, california is long it's big really well yeah it's the uh it's not the it's it's the blue lines that are that are the right, shadow right. path yeah yeah so yeah it's 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 pretty decent sized and wasn't it shaped like that object they saw in the new horizons when it went way past jupiter didn't it run into a pin a pin shaped thing with two parts no you see those like that that second one i showed that's kind of like look, looks like a paramecium but patroclus and Miletius are, are orbiting each other so they're not they're not it's not a contact binary i see wow fascinating stuff How you many can see you... here tom has brought up iota this is the the main page where you could go to learn about how to do this and and they also have links to uh, what equipment you need and and you know where you can get it and they sell packages and then you can see, of course, their main uh, graphic there is, is another binary asteroid that was discovered using occultations. You can see one of them has a big chunk taken out of it, and one of them's uh, kind of spheroidal. <laughs> How many do you think you've occulted in your lifespan there, Mr. McPartland? Oh, it's 56 or so, I think, so far since 2014. And I'm sure you have a big photo album book on your coffee table just filled with... No. <laughs> little blinking stars. Tom, could you go back to the uh, map that shows the lines on the California? Okay, hold on. Let me get back there. I think it was 74 miles instead of kilometers. It's, it's yeah, it's probably a third the size that what California is long, or maybe a quarter. Wow, is it have a, does it have a name? Patroclus and Menetius were the two pieces. Oh. Initially, it was just called Patroclus because they thought it was a single one. But it's two. It's two orbiting it's two. asteroids? Yes. It's a binary asteroid. No kidding. Well, the smaller of the two so would the, be an asteroid moon, wouldn't it? Sort of? Yeah, sort of. <laughs> so the blue lines look like they are estimates of where the edges are likely to be rather than yes. the actual size of the asteroid well they're they're the size of the asteroid if it if it goes along the predicted center line okay. and then the red lines are the one sigma where there's the uncertainty in the orbit and uncertainty okay. in the star position well since you have names blue lines will change, right they, they are because parallel light going past the uh asteroid yeah yeah there but, might be a, an error in overall position but the width of that should be the same do right. you ever have any repeats? The same asteroid? Uh, oh, yeah. I've had a couple where the same asteroid. If you've got an asteroid passing through a busy part of the Milky Way, from our point of view, it can do multiple occultations in one evening. They just don't all happen at the same place on the Earth. Mm -hmm. And these stars are something we could see visibly with our naked eye, or do they, are they? Uh, rarely. Rarely. It's yeah. much more common for a dim star to be, get occulted because there are a lot more dim stars. I see. Fascinating. From our point of view. They're thousands. They're not necessarily dim stars, but from our point of view, they're dim. Uh, Chuck, my, qu my question would be, how, what's the smallest asteroid that they'll try to get? Something like five kilometers. That's the smallest, okay. Three yeah. miles, huh? Three yeah. miles across. Yeah. How many it depends, of you, you know, are it, there? It all, it all depends on the accuracy you have on the orbit, whether, whether it's worth trying for. You'll see some of the error bars are huge. Like, uh, this not only works for asteroids, but for trans-Neptunian objects. And the first data they got on Arrowcock, the one that was visited by New Horizons being a binary object came from occultations. And those have error bars that are usually bigger than the span of the earth. <laughs> wow. um, so they, they just say, you know, everybody on the night side of the earth, go out and give this one a try. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Trans-Neptunian objects, what would that be? 
Kuiper belt Kuiper. objects and you know oh. cloud objects, but in this case, mostly they're they're Kuiper belt. Yeah, I see. Fascinating stuff. <clears throat> well, we could probably add that to the five nights of the week. Uh, we can go to that if you want, or we can talk about uh, S stars. Uh, you you included that in your talking points, Mr. President. Yeah. Assuming we're done with occultations. Uh, you, uh, one last thing, Chuck. ISS is it going over every night? Can we see it naked eye? Little. It's not. It, no, it's. It, 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 we only see it naked eye when it's illuminated by the sun, and it's making a pass over your location near sunset or sunrise. And now I think it is in a phase where you see it early in the morning, pre-dawn, around July twelfth. It'll start making uh, evening passes again for us. Well, on YouTube, I watch Earth from Space, which is provided by NASA. I assume the cameras, there's at least two looking down from up there. But last night I watched and it didn't match because they have this little map of where it is, you know, with two of the sine waves going around the Earth. And, and it was about to go into the dark area, but it didn't show so down below on the planet. So I don't know if they're showing you the X. You know what I'm talking about? You ever look at those? on youtube or wherever yeah, I mean, they, they match up when i look at them it's uh, well, it but of course the sunrise and sunset and orbit are slightly different than on the ground it was also showing it in the middle of the pacific and yet i was seeing land masses down below yeah so that's I'm definitely sure. out of out of registration out there. of phase out of, yeah. <laughs> can i make a quick announcement on behalf of our astronomical brothers to the south this has uh, been sent to us and uh, we got notes that bcas ventura county Astronomical Society is doing an online presentation uh, called The High Frontier, The Untold Story of Gerard K. O'Neill, who you'll find out all about this Friday night, June 18th, online, 8.30 to 9.30. I assume their, uh, their website is uh, similar to ours. It's a .org. S what is it? BCAS.org. We are SBAU.org, but uh, watch that and maybe they'll plug us and maybe someday we'll be meeting again on the first Friday. You can Google VCAS and you'll get them. Okay. You guys, any of you plan to watch that if we get some time? What's that, tomorrow night? Uh -huh. it's a it's Friday. A Friday. Friday, night. Friday. Oh. So uh, can we talk about a few of the things you Google us? Do you let us know? There sure. it is. The Turk yeah, County Astronomical yeah. Let well, me read we can, what you. Let me read what, I, what you wrote or what was written down. Motion data of S stars around the Milky Way center. I can, I can run, I can give you the gist of it without the reading, you don't have okay. to Okay, you take it from there. As, As you me. know, the, there's a picture that goes with that, Tom. Can you show that? Now these are, these are this is the center of our Milky Way. And you see these, these stars are orbiting something and at some parts of their orbit, they're going at a significant fraction of the speed of light around this object. And from these orbits, you can get the mass of the, what it's going around. But, and these are radio telescope images, but you can't see anything there. So Andrea Getz got the Nobel prize for tracking this and showing these orbits. And um, um, assuming that it's a black hole, and that's what everybody is, the working hypothesis right now, but and these stars that are, are in, this, uh, in this picture are called S stars. And the number that is behind it, S or SO, the O doesn't really matter. The, um, it's the distance that they are from the center of the black, from the black hole, the, des, uh, the high mass object in order of their distance from the black hole uh, at the when they were first on the picture that they were taken by to be discovered. So they changed their position. It doesn't mean they're always that order. Did someone make a comment, Chuck? Yeah, that was the, about the order. Okay. So, um, but now there was a, and an what's in our talking points for us to read, the, uh, there's an abstract from a group at uh, Cornell that, or Columbia, I think it's Cornell, and the abstract is what I sent around to everybody with the definition of S stars, is that in detail, it does not act like a black hole because uh, several clouds have gone, have been in orbit around it. Stars have been, things have been pulled off stars, but it doesn't form <clears throat> the accretion disk that a black hole would form. And it turns out they, it can be better modeled. The behavior can in detail be better mo modeled 
if the assumption is made that it is a very dense collection of dark matter, that is, it's not a black hole of regular baryonic matter, but it's a, a dense concentration of dark matter. Whether that's true or not um, remains to be seen. It um, depends on you know, the detail, how robust their modeling is and stuff. But it's an interesting topic and an interesting hypothesis. Is there a name for the word for the letter S? Does that stand for anything? Or S O? I didn't catch that. If there is, and I are think it, it, it possibly has to do with Sagittarius because that's yeah. the area where this is going on. Yeah, this are is there... technically called Sagittarius A. Well, there's got to be more than eight. I see eight S O's on the screen. Are those the main ones that are close in? And yeah, one like. That, does it siphon off any material as it whips around close to it? No, that's what's wrong with it. It, oh, doesn't, it's... it doesn't act like a black hole would act in detail, assuming they've got the black hole model right. So they're proposing that this may be a very unusual concentration of gravitational power of some unknown type, but not a black hole. It, it, so, mentioned, it mentioned dark yeah, matter. Is, what's that? It mentioned dark matter in your posting. Is, does that have yeah. a play in there? Uh, so yeah, they, they propose <clears throat> as, first of all, this is what you see and you can't see the object. So it's gotta be some object that you can't see. Therefore it's not charged. Um, and a black hole is one candidate, but it doesn't behave in detail with a disc, accretion disc that we would think a black hole behaves. And so they're proposing that it probably behaves more like a cluster of dark matter than a black hole. This Whoa. is speculative. It's a theoretical <laughs> hypothesis based on modeling. It's not experimental evidence. The only experimental evidence is that these stars are orbiting something that's massive. So we're not looking at the center of the galaxy. The center of the galaxy yeah, has a supermassive super black hole, doesn't maybe. it? Ron, this is the, the center whole of our point galaxy. Of <clears throat> Ron, the whole point of this is that this is where that supermassive black hole is supposed to be, but they're postulating that it's not behaving like a black hole, and therefore, instead of a black hole, it may be this collection of dark matter. But it's, it's hypothetical. Hypothetically, somebody thinks that all, all galaxies, I thought, had a supermassive black hole in the middle of it, pretty much. Or something supermassive, yes. And dark matter can collect like that. Uh, SO1 okay. would be the closest or the one that comes in the closest? No, it was the one that was, dis when it was discovered was the closest. Okay, yeah. well, let's, let's say the closest one is that uh, upper blue uh, circle that we see. How close does it get in? How many astronomical units to that sucker are we away from it? The one that's most highly curved, the one that's the right. most linear like, that's the one that gets the closest. And how close, how close is it? Do, you, do they know? Is it like several? I read the number, but I don't recall. It's a few astronomical units away or something like that. I, I think it's more than that. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, I, th I think it's within a light year or something like that. Oh, what's a parsec? How many light years are in a parsec? 3.26. 3.26. Okay, yeah, what gotcha. he said. So, um, yeah. Hmm. Okay, interesting. And, and that is the center of our galaxy, even though the, the middle part we don't, we're not sure of. Yeah, the rule I heard about galaxies was that if it has a large bulge, a central bulge, then it's got a black hole in it. If it's oh. a flat galaxy or without structure like that, then it, it may not have a black hole. Does having a bar in the middle have any effect on that? I have no idea where the bar comes from or how it forms. And I By the way, you notice the north and the east uh, uh, directions that the east is reversed. Someone is looking in the there. corner of, of, yeah, pardon? Mm. Must have been taken in a mirror. Yeah. <laughs> We're back to that again. Bruce was referring to a joke I sent out where they're looking up in a <laughs> castle oh. with a refra refractor telescope and yeah. a uh, Catadioptric telescope. Well, Bruce, a vampire this is the standing classic. on the balcony, and you can't see the vampire in the telescope that has a mirror. <laughs> oh, Bruce, that I took a while Bruce, to get that's, that. that's a standard yeah. representation of the sky. That's not reversed. If you if really, you look at oh, any that right. map, you hold it overhead. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. Okay. I get it. 
I swear I get it now. With your, but although that, that that other one, meteorologist, there's a, that was a good cartoon. I don't know where you get those, Mister President, but they're awesome. Thank you. Uh, if you take this, you take this just, image and print it, and then you hold it overhead because that's what you'll see. Then the north and the east will be probably oriented. All Tim right. Crawford, Tim Crawford has a question about how can they measure these things if they're traveling at the speed of light? Is that a problem for the radio telescopes, I guess, that they're using? Well, yeah. it, it's an infrared telescope that they use for this. And they're not traveling at a, you know, at a huge fraction of the speed of light. But it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fraction of the speed of light, which is pretty fast. Yeah. Yeah. They, the stars shine by their own light. So at the instant you look, they, you can see them. They're not streaks. They're not moving that fast. And well, these, these are what, like 3% Chuck, Chuck's right, this was an infrared light. telescope. I said, I said um, radio telescope. These are like 3% or 5% of the speed of light at their closest, right? Yeah. Something like that. Tom Whittemore, you want to weigh in on this? What do you think? Well, I was just, Ron, I was just going to suggest the moniker for this unknown collection there that's causing this gravitational, you know, anomaly. Right. SOB. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. President, whoever came up with this dark matter instead of a black hole theory, they're going to have to redefine the whole center again. And does it have a singularity? Does the dark matter, is it condensed into its own black hole? Does it have a event horizon? Any the, of those? The whole, the whole um, dark matter scenario that we have now is that dark matter doesn't clump very easily. So it's, it's yeah. probably hard to make one of these that has a singularity. The, the well, dark matter doesn't seem to interact with itself much, okay. other than gravitationally. Well, dark matter is supposedly everywhere, but it doesn't interact with us, but it adds weight somehow. It, it interacts with us gravitationally and only gravitationally that we know mm -hmm. about. Well, then it would be clustered around, there'd be dark matter clustered around the Earth, but not as much out between you us can, and Mars. By measuring the velocities of stars in a galaxy, you can map the, the shape of the dark matter clouds involved in that galaxy. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And have they not found some galaxies out there that they don't think have any dark matter around them at all somehow? One, I think they found one like that, if I recall. Yeah, it, it comes would, and goes. You, you see one you know, set of studies will come out and they say, oh, we found three of these really low dark matter galaxies. And then uh, you know, a few months later, one comes out and says, well, you, know, you can still account for that with dark matter by this distribution. So it comes and goes. Yeah. So Ron, we don't know enough yet. Ron, our galaxy, I think, is 80% dark matter. So we live in a dark matter galaxy in a sense. So. But why is it that non-dark matter galaxy that Mr. President told us about flying off into space and fragmenting well, it's, and it's still well, got its own baryonic gravitational attraction. Yeah, matter has gravity, you know. Yeah. But uh, I my understanding is there's not just one big huge black hole in the middle. There's millions of black holes. Like there, well, there are millions may be, of but this one is a super biggie. I know that, but a black hole is a pretty big thing. It's like a planet gone or multiple, or, you know, something as big yeah. as what Jupiter or bigger manages to well, collapse. And the the the, the um, event horizon for the if it's a 4.3 million solar mass black hole at the core of our galaxy, the event horizon would be out around the orbit of Mars if you put it where our sun is. Okay. But where would all the mass be concentrated? A single point or something the size of a that's planet? A, that's a, a completely open question. They don't know. But the event horizon, for the benefit of the folks listening that don't know, that's the uh, layer at which we, what, time stops and there's no coming back? That's, that's where even light can't escape from it. But the if light you, we do see is, is uh, spinning around the, the accretion ditch disk and gets tossed out. That, that's if you were to travel into a black hole and you approach the event horizon and you would you would not notice anything and when you pass through it you wouldn't notice anything so no, she'd be real it's tall a -event, it's a mathematical construct <clears throat> and that's the layer at which it takes more energy to get out of that than that light has to invest in it so but if you're if you're looking from the outside and someone falls into a black hole they will appear to slow down and stop before they get to the black to the event horizon. 
<laughs> okay, interesting stuff. Okay, uh, shall we go to the night sky? Or you sure. want to talk real quickly about Venus? What what do they plan to do? Three missions, one uh, with ESA, that's European Space Agency, and we're doing two, right? And uh, yeah, there's... Go ahead. go ahead. Chuck, you well, are. Yeah, Chuck. You know what? Nothing? Let well, me I mean, one of them, uh, two of them are going to look at um, volcanic activity and, and potential tectonic plates. Um, and the European one is going to be just narrowing, looking at small patches of Venus. But the others are going to be looking overall and doing mapping and, and, and especially searches for active volcanism, is, was my impression. Theirs is called Envision. And it's going to study the planet. Um, I'm not sure, I guess orbiting, we're not going to, not going to land. Uh, NASA is sending two probes. One is Veritas or Veritas, and the other is Veritas. the Da Vinci. Veritas. We're going to help each other, right? Tom, and can you show the picture of Venus that I included? Yes. One moment. Okay. It's, it's, the planet is about the same size as ours. I think 90% uh, of ours or something like that. Yeah, and uh, it turns the other direction, doesn't it? It rotates opposite us, does it? Now, not? and this this is an artist rendition, and the light tan things that border it are called um, tesserae, and that's what they're looking at. They want to understand whether tesserae's are the equivalent of granite on Earth. Um, I guess mm. it has some structure to radio waves or radar that make people, geologists think this might be the Martian or the Venus equivalent of granite. If it is, that would be very exciting because granite has to form uh, in the presence of water. And so that would mean that there's a past of water on Venus. Oh, uh, and we're looking at oceans there, the blue? No, no, the blue, these are false colors and they indicate, um, from radar images, they indicate um, surface roughness or porosity. Wow. Well, that's certainly not the general color of Venus. I get the impression it's like a tan, yellowish, oh, golden. Way purple. over on the right is the you know, color of Venus that we see. Oh. Yeah. All we see is clouds, Ron. Those other images you see where it's kind of an orangey color, those are just false color radar images. Right. Didn't we learn from the Russians with their Venera program that sent several probes there and landed a few and one of them lasted a few minutes that it ain't going to pay to let, try to get any rovers on venus where well, there's probably nothing we could make them out of that would make them well, survive right nasa's working on that actually they're working on um the problem is it fries your electronics oh and they are working on sort of mechanical rovers they're kind of i guess you you know it's like sending a wind-up toy to venus because <laughs> they could make them much more resistant to the heat well, there it is. That's the Venus I'm familiar with. Uh, the direction we're going, our planet's going to be like that in a few million years. Yeah, we're it? working on it. <laughs> okay, so we'll be watching that later in the uh, decade, several years from now. We'll still be around, gentlemen. Also, they've uh, postponed the Webb telescope, which is the radio telescope was supposed to go out to the Lagrange point, a million miles. It's not that a radio telescope, Ron. It's, it's uh, infrared. Oh, it's not radio. No. Oh, okay. But they're all photons, right? Whether they're radio they waves. They are. <laughs> but uh, they, they want to get that sucker out there, I guess. It's going toward the sun. Is that where it's going to rest completely? No. Away no, from I'm the not... sun. Yeah. Or away from the sun. And there's a point out there that'll stay. Well, never mind. That's another show we'll talk about. Would you like to do the night sky based on what I've written down here? from uh, Jerry's point. Tonight, Monday, the 14th, hour after sunset, uh, the uh, Big Dipper is staging, uh, is on its edge, standing on edge, mm -hmm. uh, with its, uh, what, handle pointing up, uh, landing on a spiral galaxy, M, can't read my own writing, also tip of the handle known as, let's see, Whirlpool Galaxy, is that, okay, there we are. Yeah, M51. M51 for Messier. Okay, for yeah, Mr. Messier's. And that's called the Whirlpool. And then we see that face on, don't we? And yep. there's also it's also known as NGC 5194. Is that the oh, yeah, that one, yeah. Scientific um, name. 
this is a this is an image that you're not likely to see in your telescope. <laughs> really? Yeah, it's that, Hubble. That's from the Hubble. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's located in Canis Venatici, I guess is how that's pronounced. The hunting dogs. Is that a constellation? Yeah. 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 Yes. And Ursa Major. <laughs> and um, a few million years ago, NGC 5191 or 95 ran into. Oh, they're both uh, colliding? Is yeah, they're, they had a collision. And the big one won. It. Okay. So by now they've probably gotten together and we're just looking at mm -hmm. the light that arrived now all the all the red areas you see the red clumps in the spiral arms those are nebulae hydrogen nebula like uh the great nebula in orion those are star forming regions really and you see how the um center of both galaxies is more yellow and the arms are more bluish so and that's a, obviously not a barred galaxy. I think it's about the size. No, of that one's unless there's a some kind of a bar way inside. But uh, yeah, this is a nice spiral. The other one looks like it actually may have been a bar. Okay, it's not, and it's a yeah, run, be like, running up and down. Aren't we looking so. at what's going to happen between us and Triangulum before Andromeda gets here, or is that happening? Triangulum's uh, uh, one of those. Neighborhood little baby galaxy. Triangulum's the one behind me, and it's kind of um, a um, it's part of the local group. And those group, those galaxies, we are all blue shifted from each other. That is, gravity is holding us together more than it holds the much farther away galaxies to us. But so they're going to collide. Are, those are actually not receding from us. Okay, the last to arrive here will be Andromeda. Long after the other ones have been absorbed by. I don't know the order that we're going to get hit, but uh, okay. Chuck, you recall? No, I, I think Andromeda is the one that's heading toward us the fastest, so that'll probably be the first. And there's lots of little dwarf galaxies, yeah, larger right. small clouds of Magellan that that will probably merge before that. You gentlemen at the bottom of the screen want to comment? You got anything on that, Tom or Bruce? Just out of curiosity. <laughs> I've seen that galaxy in binoculars. We think that many galaxies, including our own, are a collection of other galaxies. We were smaller before and we had collisions in the past, billions of yep. years ago, right? Yep. And somehow they go through each other. We've seen the computer generations where they just sort of fall through each other and end up a ball again and spinning. You wanna do Tuesday night sky, Leo the lion is headed nose down toward the horizon at sunset. And the moon is now 29% lit crescent is um, near Eta Leonis. Jump in yeah, and go to that picture, Tom. Okay. Yeah, you grab that while I continue reading with a bright star Regulus 4, uh, which is in the south, north of Leo, a smaller <laughs> constellation, Leo Minor, the lion cub, which mm -hmm. is home to deep sky stuff like NGC 3432, uh, here it's coming, which is home to- No, this is not it. Uh -huh. this, is, this is NGC 32 and- Oh, no, 44. you're right. You're right. Excuse me, I'm wrong. Yeah. This is an one and an 2 isn't it? Yeah, no, it's not. This is um, oh. the, the triangle, just the right of center is Leo Minor. And oh. Leo is this other constellation just to the left, lower left. And you can see the moon down there, which in, will interfere tonight and increasingly in the next nights with seeing these faint fuzzies. Now, these faint fuzzies here are images that I took off the internet and, and put them in the right place, but these are out of scale. They're a little bit too big, but it shows you where these are with respect to the constellations. Okay, we're looking and that's at- That's the rear end. That's kind of the legs of the, of the bear there. Uh, up above, right? The old Ursa. Yeah. Okay. You took that picture, Mr. President? No, I did not take these pictures. The <laughs> pictures of the galaxy I took off of the internet and the image of the stars and the constellations I got from Software Bisks, um, the Sky Six, which it I used. A, it which was a I beautiful moon last telephone. night with the, with a lot of Earthshine. Well, Say that again, a, please. 
Yeah. Did anybody see the moon and Venus on Friday evening? It was just. Oh, that was beautiful. Yeah. They were like, oh, yeah. From my backyard. Um, that was just incredible. And I've been watching the moon, you know, call up, up, up through Gemini. And now it's, uh, I guess, in Leo. Uh -huh. That phenomenal near meeting. Yeah. We went up to East Cielo, Chuck Jeweler and I. And the sky was black, but the wind's ferocious. Oh, really? So I didn't take any pictures. Yeah. Why? Did it, did it, okay, let's it. move on to Wednesday. Wednesday, we have, <laughs> I assume it's pronounced Boatis, Boatis, B O O. Oh, good, good luck on that one. Boatis. Yeah, Boatis, the herdsmen, <clears throat> will be high in the south after sunset, anchored by the bright star Arcturus. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a kite shaped constellation, which includes several stars, including three double stars. Uh, news to me here, we have um, Kappa, Iota, and Pi Boetus. Uh, Tom, could you show the picture that's with that? While Thank I'm reading, you. each is visible uh, with the naked eye. Yeah, and now the um, um, way up at the, up here, up above a little bit, below 101, M101 over here on the left of center. Down a little bit, see, I've got the names next to the star. Okay, there we go. Yeah, Wednesday now, night. These are these are double stars, and they're uh, striking. They're like little, um, like headlights. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then and then there's another one down below the Arcturus down here in Buddhist. Or yeah, over there. Keep going there, right there. Now that says Phi, but I, I it's a typo. It should be P I, not P H I. That's another double star. These are both, and they're separated by uh, on the order of 10 arc seconds. So they're easily the split in small scopes, three inches or so. Uh, and they're quite dramatic. They are each different color, Kappa, Iota, and Pi. Uh, mm -hmm. Jerry, is this the one that's like separated by like 100 and, or has an orbit time of 169 years or something? That sounds no. about right. No, I, I no. That's the he was talking about um, Parima in in Virgo with that. That's one oh. where you can see the star's orbit in a human lifetime. Oh, that's coming up. Okay. Yeah. Sounds like you got your work cut out for you on Wednesday the sixteenth, guys. I'll learn to pronounce B O O T E S, which is what German kind of a Boutes. Boutes. No, Boutes. <laughs> All right. Tom. Tom, Tom, what is that? What does the double dots above the O kind of indicate, Tom? I think it's it? just indicating a syllable. It's it's not a German word. It's not an umlaut. Okay. Mm -hmm. I always just said Bootis. That's how I always said it. And Arcturus is actually one of my favorite stars. It's very mm -hmm. very pretty. It's a double. No. Oh, it's no, I don't think no, it's just the bright no. star that you'd use to start your search. Yeah, it's it's the fourth brightest star in the night sky, if I'm right. Chuck, sound right? It's, it's the brightest in the northern hemisphere. Yeah. The Sirius yeah. is Sirius in the, is southern, in yeah. the southern hemisphere, technically. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned the double headlights. Is that seen only in a heli in a in a telescope? We can't. Yes. Yeah. Are there any double stars that you can tell are doubles with the naked eye? Mm hmm. Handle the Dipper. Yeah. Really? It's two little dots. Okay. Mm -hmm. Easily. My horse and rider, my are an Alcor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, hey. let's move on to the next day. There and, is don't, day. and don't, don't forget that uh, Arcturus is the bottom of the ice cream cone there. Right. Yeah. That, that's the lead in for Chuck. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and and and, and uh, the crown. Yeah, <laughs> down there, Corona Borealis, the northern crown. Co yeah. Come down. Corona Borealis is below. To the right. It's not marked, yeah. No, yeah, right there. You can see. Yeah, uh, okay. So that's a scoop of ice cream that used to be. It used to be a double decker <laughs> ice cream cone for abilities. Okay. But one scoop fell off, and then Hercules over there on the left, that's who knocked off the ice cream. <laughs> that is that represented here in outreach mode, big time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did they have that represented as a cartoon on the inside uh, ceiling of the planetarium? Do they have an ice cream cone up there? I don't think there so. There is an ice cream cone asterism display that you can put up in the planetarium, yes. I haven't seen it. 
Okay, we also got to talk about Summer Triangle, but you want to get through Thursday and Friday. Speaking of your asteroids, good old three Juno. Is that the one? Yeah. Uh, lies in the northeast outskirts of the globular cluster M10 tonight, yeah, yes. Thursday. So is it, would it be in the Trojans? That us? Juno? I no, think Juno's the main belt. Yeah. But it's got Jupiter. Oh, wait a minute. Juno's, yeah. Isn't that the name of the orbiter of Jupiter? Yes. Yes. The, also the name of a mission. Yeah. Okay. And here's that word. I love this. The 13th house, Ophiuchus. Yes, it's part of the zodiac, and people born between late November and early December are in this in this house. That's me. And their their uh, <laughs> astrological chart is a blank slate. <laughs> and is that an ancient goddess or something, Ophiuchus? That that's Asclepius. <laughs> that's the Greek uh, physician holding a snake. That's okay. right, Caduceus. Yeah, he's the serpent bearer, Ron. Oh, it is. Oh, yeah, it's the serpent bearer. Serpents goes right through the center of him. So there's a serpent on our on our twelve house zodiac. I don't recall. No, no, it's not, no. It's too high up. It's not on the ecliptic, right? Aphiuchus is, but the serpents yeah. aren't. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay, you want to know more about Thursday, or shall we go to Friday? We're running out of time. Friday. Friday's the waxing moon. It's growing on us. Nestled in uh, Virgo, shortly after sunset, uh, the brightest stars uh, popping out would be, let's see if I can read my writing. My lighting is just terrible here. Horima, does that sound right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Horima is, is the nice double. Okay. Mm -hmm. Magnitude 2.7. Or, or binary. The, okay. To the southeast. Uh, brighter magnitude one dot spica. Is that? the word i'm looking at virgo's yeah out. yeah out. yeah after if you follow the curve and handle the big dipper you can arc to arcturus and then spike to spica right <laughs> the new one on me and then we have uh let's see named after a roman goddess virgo's alpha five let's see uh, goddess right. of prophecy from yeah Latin. well she, she she's also series greek oh, series she, which is uh, the Lady of the Harvest, basically. And yeah. Spica yeah. represents a spike of wheat that she's holding. Right. Oh, spike of wheat. <laughs> I, okay. I don't know if there's an interesting star up in this region here uh, called Vendemiatrix, which from Latin means basically a grape gatherer. So the Romans uh, would notice that when that star was very close to the sun, okay, it was time to gather the grapes and make wine. So that, that's where that name came from, Vendemiatrix. Interesting. Does anybody know? I, I, don't know if, I don't know if it's in, in, in this, uh, on this uh, uh, chart here, but it's, it's not super far from Parima. Okay. And, and there's, all those darn, there's all those beautiful galaxies. <laughs> anybody happen to know when we're going to have a full moon this month? Late next week, perhaps? Just did. Oh, full moon. Oh. I'd be in another two weeks. Full moon, yeah. But I can have. I think it'll probably be on first Sagittarius quarter. is my guess, because it's going to be a low mover. It's going to be low in the sky. You know, a summertime full moon rides really low. All right, gentlemen, what can we say in a minute or a minute and a half about an asterism called Summer Triangle? We're going to start <laughs> seeing that in the North Hemis Northern Hemisphere sky. There it is. Yeah. Oh, you're awesome, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> All night in the summer, comprised of three bright blue stars, Deneb in Cygnus. Altair mm -hmm. in Aquila and Vega in Lyra. Mm -hmm. There it is. And yep. we can watch that. At, what does it go out of sight below the horizon in winter? Yes. No, it's actually visible well into winter. Yeah. Like December. Oh, yeah. But we always see it. Like yeah, you can easily see Vega in the northeastern sky now at, uh, you know, nine-ish. Very easily see it. Okay. To me, so it's the sign that summer is here. Yeah. You know. Overhead, it this stuff will be straight up in a short yeah. while. Yeah, okay. And the Australian version would be the Southern Cross, which we never see, right? Right. Okay, well, unless just... you're in Southern Florida or oh, Hawaii. Really? Yeah. Okay. I think we're down to the wire. I think we've done a good job. It's getting better. We had no technical glitches this time, and our wives are in the background there. Incidentally, we want you're, to... Uh, you're tempting fate. <laughs> <laughs> 
No, I didn't hear anything. Uh, I appreciate the Bruce, you getting your microphone fixed. I didn't hear any static <laughs> your voice, uh, Mr. President. And we're just oh. now waiting for the pandemic to go away. Tomorrow, yeah. we get to remove the mask and go out in public. I'm not sure how many of you are going to do that. But uh, stay safe anyway. And hopefully the new Delha, Delhi variant won't get hold of us. <laughs> it's going to na nail a lot of people. And we'll do this again next Monday morning. Fair enough. We got a date? Yep. Good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. There should be a click right, off. Yep. There it is on the bottom. Take care and thank you for a thank very you, Ron. That's the podcast.